When Ryan's when it's time to begin, it's on the rewind around with John Pollock and waiting. The A team that makes sense of these things we see in the ring every week on TV. It's rewind around for Monday night, then load a Tuesday morning from the post wrestling site. It's rewind around for Monday night on USA now on the John and Wade take the mic. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Rewind to Raw. I am John Pollock, joined as always by Wei Ting. How are you, Wei? I'm doing well, John. Thanks. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing very nice. You have a good weekend? Uh, yeah, I think so. Average think weekend? So. Uh, at this point, it's pretty average. You know, um, a pay-per-view. Um, some wrestling. Oh, yeah, there was a pay-per-view this weekend, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of digest and i completely forget about it afterwards mm-hmm. well we have a we have a interesting edition of raw to get to we have a lot of news to discuss and it's a brand new week here at post wrestling we will be going over all of that but it was a a very packed weekend and if you want to catch up on anything that you missed i think we have a show for it from uh post pro res with wh park and karen peterson our post pro res team coming at you to kick off the weekend and then Rewind to SmackDown, a Crown Jewel review, a Collision Course review, and not to mention uh, the latest MCU later with WH Park and Rich Fan, and of course a Power Struggle review too with maybe the um, the standout match I would say of the weekend between Will Ospreay and uh, Shota Umino, but plenty uh, to dive into on the Post Wrestling Cafe as well as PostWrestling.com. As always, yeah, uh, that just seems to be the pace. I mean, at one point, I don't know if we were really doing any sort of weekend shows. Now it feels like we got like 15 shows every weekend. So that's when the fun happens. Yeah, you know, it's our uh, it's our, our our rights renewal is up. So, you know, we're just uh, putting out more content uh, because of uh, the average annual value just uh, skyrocketing. Are those terms just like drilled into your, you know, common everyday phrasing now? If they're not, they will be by the end of this TKO earnings call this week, uh, which goes down Tuesday night, and we will have the official review with Brandon Thurston later this week. Uh, Lots more to come, but before we get into the wrestling portion, uh, over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about um, the online bidding process. I mean, we talk about the bidding for, for media rights all the time, but you know what? The hottest content in town is... Uh, your very own edition of Rewind Away, and you have a chance to be able to go out and bid and support a great uh, foundation on top of that. And uh, here to join us for just a couple of minutes is a good friend of the show, Robert Pearson, here to talk to us about what you can be getting your hands or your your ears on by bidding uh, and supporting the Doe Fund. So Robert, how are you tonight? I'm doing great, guys. Thank you so much for having me and, and giving me a couple minutes to come on and, uh, yeah, talk a little bit about, of course, the post-wrestling lot and, and some of the other fun things we've got. So tell us a little bit about what this, uh, what the Doe Fund is and and what this uh, process is for you. This is the second year that you have been uh, presenting this. Yeah, this is the second year that I've worked with the Doe Fund, and they're a great organization. They're New York-based, and basically they help um, sort of people who are transitioning, whether they've been experiencing homelessness, whether they've been incarcerated, and they help them become professionals. They help give them the tools and the resources they need to you know, get jobs and, and, and start careers, and they've got amazing stories and people who have, who have gone through the program and come out the other side, and so I feel really lucky for the last couple of years to get to to partner with them to help raise some funds. And uh, this year, what makes it unique is we have this uh, this auction aspect where you don't uh, just, you know, you can, of course, just make a direct donation. uh, But if you want to have something a little fun, you can uh, you can get in on the bidding. Yes. Well, I mean, topping the list is this chance to have your own edition of Rewind Away that you can bid on. You can pick any. MMA or pro wrestling show you would like, we're going to review it. You have the chance to come on with us and as well, getting a merchandise bundle, which quite frankly, I might bid on because I don't have access to these shirts and they look, uh, they look wonderful here. I think uh, this, this would maybe break my rule of wearing a shirt with my own name on it. I mean, this is a a beautiful design uh, that you have the chance to get to. And uh, this is a very cool uh, option for people out there that maybe have not uh, jumped onto our uh, espresso tier uh, for rewind away but your chance to uh, see what all the fun is about. 
And in addition to getting to pick the event and obviously getting the merch bundle, uh, whatever event you pick, I'll also be doing a piece of artwork for it. Um, as that is sort of something consistent with most of the lots, there's a piece of art or something that's framed that comes with it. Um, so yeah, whatever event you you choose, hopefully it's not uh, you know something maybe like a, a night in China, you know something along these lines. Where I know the, in in the old days, sometimes were some of your anniversary um, specials. So I don't know if we if we speak of those times anymore. But you know, I'm uh, hopefully again, it's just a, a straight. My, my credit event. card is still feeling the effects of that uh, that, that purchase. Yeah, I, I think that one will, we will probably veto. Uh, but uh, Robert, uh, care to talk about some of the other lots that you currently have available? Uh, yeah. Here? I mean, John, I know you're a Survivor fan, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, you you can't. How, how are you able to track down all members of season 44? I mean, this is this is quite the get on your part. Well, I am fortunate that uh, one of the members of the cast is actually my my former assistant, um, Maddie, and so when she went to the premiere or the premiere, the uh, finale rather, it was here in New York, and so she was able to get this uh, this handsome cast photo signed by all members. Uh, I think that's 18 cast members. Forgive my inability to frame live here but uh yeah so this is one of the lots um i think there's only a couple people who are actually bidding on this so th this this is one of the more interesting the non-combat sports uh related but and and you will know that the guy that is third from the right standing at the back this is the guy who, his name escapes me but he was he was stretchered off of this season after slicing his head open on the beach and has come back this season and he oh, has wow. gone pretty deep so far. So this is a back-to-back -back this... survivor on consecutive seasons as well. So this, yeah, I mean, this is already increasing in value, clearly. Um, it will, and, and speaking of people who have had their heads sliced open once or twice, uh, every everyone's favorite scumbag, uh, the devil himself. We have a couple pieces. We have, this is, is this, of course, a piece of art that I did. Uh, and while I was in Toronto this year, um, I was able to get this signed. Uh, and, and in addition to, the MJF print, which is autographed, you also get, and forgive me, because this is a little heavy, this beautiful, oh, no joke, it weighs about 16 pounds, this AEW Heavyweight Championship, that's also autographed by uh, by the reigning defending. Jay White literally stole this title and gave it to Robert Pearson, and he is now making money off of it. So. I mean, you know, at least, I don't know if it's the best heel move to try to do it for charity, but I do appreciate Jay coming through. Uh, that It is the bang bang belt uh, could be yours uh, in addition to that but also in addition to belts i did I, we do have one this is really fun this is brand new um this is a belt that i actually designed this is for the good folks over at cheap heat um a, a ringer podcast with peter rosenberg and my dear friend uh greg hyde and uh not only will you could you get your own belt but this is a removable nameplate so you can Ooh. get rosenberg's but i just assume you'll toss that and then you'll, you'll have your own that you can slap on there so this is a, a brand new this is my third belt that i've designed and i've worked with uh, andrew over at wildcats who they do all the wwe championship belts so this is uh, as legit as it gets um, but this is another another lot you get a call with peter in addition to the belt um oh what else do we got here there's so much fun stuff you get, get a, you, you can get an in-studio call from uh, Ariel Hawani as well. You can, yes, you can that's go for right. That. There's a personalized belt uh, from Daniel Cormier uh, as well. I mean, this is like you, you've got your bases covered here. An MVP personalized vintage WWE US championship. So, I mean, you were you were knocking on some doors and hitting some people up here. I mean, honestly, guys, it's been about about 10 months in the making of just networking and trying to get in. And, and honestly, way while we're here, thank you so much. I mean, I was just showing off the uh the the mjf piece and way was very helpful in, in helping me get connected and making that happen so i've certainly been uh, again knocking on everyone's door including the post door uh to make this happen but it, and i'll say this too because there's less than 24 hours tomorrow at 7 p.m the auction wraps up um but the reality is is, is the guy who purchased all this stuff i can tell you some of these items like the mvp lot you mentioned it's currently the opening bid is not only lower than what it actually costs if you tried to buy the belt on wwe but of course it's it's personalized you get you get the autograph and then you get the artwork as well so you know even if maybe it's not something you're so into if it's somebody you know in the family you might it's a really good gift and i and i don't want to get in any trouble but you know you you order this you sit on it for a couple years might be a nice return on the investment because uh again some of these lots are still sitting 
sitting pretty low. So, um, yeah, lots of reasons in addition to just, you know, raising money for a good cause. Uh, you know, these these lots could maybe raise a little money for you, too. If you know what so so the um, auction ends what time, Robert? 7 p.m. tomorrow. And the way Charity Buzz works is, um, you know, if there's anybody else bidding, it can kind of go into overtime. Um, but yeah, tomorrow, uh, uh, the 7th of November, it'll be ending at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, yeah, so you have all of today, or all of tomorrow, rather, that you can still get in on it. So uh, get get your bids in right now. At at this moment, um, you will get a lot of these items at a steal. And again, this is all for charity. So at the very least, we hope Robert breaks even, you know, so that he could <laughs> he can get to uh, the Doe Fund some some of uh, some much needed support. But um, thank you so much, Robert, for you know coming on and uh, you know asking us to be a part of this. It's uh, it's something we're very happy to be a part of. Uh, charity Buzz dot com slash mmm2 is the website charitybuzz.com slash mmm2 yes sir thank you guys so much for the time uh have a great night and have a great review thanks a lot robert we really appreciate it absolutely all right everyone so uh there you go if you, if you want to get in um especially if you want to do your own rewind away and it is a, it's a, it's a really great um cause with the doe fund as well you're really helping people uh on top of this and that's why we've uh attached ourselves to this so uh appreciate everyone uh listen to to robert go through some of the uh the options of what you can uh bid on but we have a lot of news to get into, and as we talked a bit about on uh, Crown Jewel, but want to uh, reiterate here, coming out of Saturday's wrestle, uh, Power Struggle show, we now have five matches official for Wrestle Kingdom 18 with Sonata against Tetsuya Naito that I feel way as we go week by week towards Wrestle Kingdom. I just feel this match, does this feel like the main event of Wrestle Kingdom? It does not to me mm -hmm. as of now. And I would say at this point, it feels like an easy uh, number three match and might fall lower than that. It just feels like a very cold match. And I was expecting something bigger on Power Struggle to heat this one up, but it's sort of just, it's where we're going and that's it. I, I can't say that this Sonata title run has really invigorated the the product and for the talk of Sonata like reaching this level I, I can't say it's been that satisfying of a rain thus far no not at all I mean it's the match that they might have put the most um long-term effort into building um they there's they've certainly been committed to the Sonata experiment I, I I wouldn't even call it an experiment really at this point um and this is sort of like the what's meant to peak and crescendo it right the former two LIJ members facing off um you just haven't heard much about Sonata's run, you know? Is, um, is this all about Naito getting his win and he gets his celebratory moment at the Tokyo Dome? Yeah. Mm -hmm. because That's in, the hook. Because in my mind, he wins this title and he thinks he's getting the celebration. And there is Katsuhiko Nakajima to ruin it for him. And he loses his celebration once again at the, at the Tokyo Dome. He's laid out unconscious. I guess if he wants to, you know... Um, at some point finish his story you don't you don't want to extinguish that right you stories know, you never end going. they just keep That's going it. um he's also gonna have eye surgery again like this is his uh i think third surgery he has had like he has had wow. for years like this double vision problem and it's been this time of the year when he's got kind of the break he's i assume he's not doing tag league and hmm. therefore has this gap between this and wrestle kingdom is that why he does this all the time He's trying to like look well look, i think i think better. over time well it, the origins of that were kind of kind of like racist right. taunts that were levied towards him but now it might actually just be so he can see clearly yes mm -hmm. uh so okada and danielson the rematch also set for january the 4th and uh si.com noting the fact that had it not been for the orbital injury that danielson would have flown over there and done this challenge in person which would have been a cool moment in osaka that said this video was awesome oh, and so i mean with the bandaged eye i i think this was probably came off better than had he been there in person and he's injury free i mean you mm -hmm. they were going to probably do some kind of a uh, worked injury at, at at the least or or something like that but I thought this turned out great on Saturday. The reaction I thought was just as big. Um, and I think you, you you have like an extra level of uh, almost like mysticism seeing like Danielson, you know, we, we've seen him. Um, he's hanging out in the mountains. He's kind of hanging out in, in, in just mother nature. He's meditating next to a pond. I mean, this gave you a, a much better kind of character profile than simply appearing in, you know, uh, in Osaka. Um, but I guess if you're a wrestler um, and if it's November, 
take care of your eyes. Okay. That's sort of um, the lesson we're learning between these first two uh, matches. Uh, and then Will Ospreay, John Moxley, and David Finley in a three-way match to create a new championship after the destruction of the UK and US championships. Uh, Hiromu Takahashi against El Desperado and Clark Connors and Drilla Maloney defending the junior heavyweight tag titles against Francesco Akira and TJP. So those are our five matches. You'll get the tag title matches with the winner of a World Tag League. And I mean, a lot of the major names sort of accounted for uh, at, the, at this point going into the Dome. Yeah, something that didn't necessarily hit me until maybe um, after our show on Saturday is that uh, we're not getting Osprey versus Omega at nope. Wrestle Kingdom. Nope, and at this point, I, I don't see a role for Omega really on the show at all. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it's it's hard to imagine them just uh, shoehorning him in. I mean, they could. Uh, you, you could put him somewhere. But this sort of feels as though this is probably your... Your, your involvement is to the extent of, of Danielson and if anyone else is kind of thrown mm -hmm. in and Moxley, of course, uh, as well. So over uh, the last couple of weeks as well, uh, JP Morgan uh, has put out uh, this analysis of the TKO stock and I'm not going to go through all of it. It's like this 43 page uh, document that I, I got to go through and just some of the highlights from this analysis is that they're looking at the TKO stock, which is trading at around the $84 mark. They feel by the end of next year, like the price target of the stock should be about $100. So they see it very undervalued at present and noting the same things like where the SmackDown renewal came in. Uh, but also, like, like we have said, the fact that the investment from Saudi Arabia into the PFL seems very overblown in terms of PFL being a real threat to the UFC. Uh, but they believe that, number one, they're pretty optimistic about the raw rights thinking that some people might have been holding off bidding for what they perceive as the more valuable package in raw than smackdown and they see four candidates for raw one being disney which would see raw on fx this is all according to their expectation and the idea that they you could see number one fx acquire a property like raw that could increase their subscriber fees but also potential a potential idea of putting the third hour on hulu which disney is in the process of buying outright um so that would not affect us uh in canada but for the u.s i mean that's that's one option the other being amazon prime warner brothers discovery with their explanation that they don't rule out fox sports potentially bidding on aew if they want to stay in professional wrestling and here is a much more it's something we've said from the get-go. Like, I don't think this is a case of Fox being anti-wrestling. I think it was a fact of, at this cost, this was just too rich for us when we can't make back the amount on advertising and it doesn't make a difference in our mm. transmission fees. But this AEW product, for a fraction of the cost, maybe that does make sense. And that would clear the way if Warner Brothers Discovery then wanted to mm. aggressively go after something like Raw. And then the fourth being NBC Universal which they see as if they don't get some giant increase elsewhere. It sounds like there's always NBC Universal at, at, at the end of it. And then of a long shot, a Netflix or an Apple, which I see as very unlikely for Raw to be mm -hmm. ending up at. But like, as you look at some of these options way, I mean, do you get the sense of, you know, Raw just getting this spectacular offer that is going to um, stun a lot of people? Or do you, you look at the SmackDown rights and think that maybe people should kind of hedge their bets on what the, the appetite's going to be for Raw. What was the multiplier for SmackDown? SmackDown got a 1.4x increase. And, and is that JP, not the same prediction for Raw? JP Morgan is ba basically estimating the same, which would bring Raw to an average annual value of $375 million, which I would say is like a good increase. I would say hmm. it's like it's, it's like $375 million a year. You're not going to be uh, crying over that. Um, but how would but the I, how would the stock react to to a one point four for raw? I don't think it would go through the roof at one point four. Hmm. I think you would want to see something like above the multiples there. But that would bring uh, like SmackDown is now at about like two eighty seven. Throw that on top of three seventy five. Like for your U.S. rights, like that that's very very strong. Hmm. And there are other reasons for optimism on the TKO stock. They feel UFC is very well positioned for its next round of rights, which expire not until the end of twenty twenty five. Although they think negotiations could begin as early as next year. And the fact is, TKO could expand. They seem very high on the idea of TKO maybe getting into boxing and still more cost synergies and leveraging the two brands together for those super weekends that they have mentioned uh, quite a bit as well. 
and it is mentioned in this, but I think it is drastically under um, valued. And that is just the threat of this um, antitrust case and how fast it's moving. Now, granted, there is a trial date for April. That could also, like, we could see appeals afterwards. Like, this could be a really long path before something is finalized in all of this. But I definitely look at, like, if, if I'm looking at threats to TKO, I'm not staying awake at night over Saudi Arabia investing in the PFL. But this antitrust case and the potential mm -hmm. effects it could also have on WWE that's such a similar business and how quickly this has moved and the aggressiveness of a, Judge uh, Judge Richard Bulware, like it is that to me is something that you can look at as um, a, a real threat to just the way UFC's business is done, and not to mention just a potentially gigantic judgment. But because of how slow the courts seem to move, it's not really a case that's really broken out into Wall Street yet, right? No, and it's yeah, it's like we could see this trial begin, and you mm -hmm. know that the just the appeals like th this could be years too yeah. as well like this is <laughs> it really does tell you like the process of this like this will be a 10 plus year case when mm -hmm. all is said and done most likely unless we get a settlement before april maybe the most interesting to me out of you know um uh everything that you you just kind of discussed and wrote about in today's update is um the fact that um somehow aew mm, will might benefit from you know, um, either Fox not uh, choosing to uh, go for WWE or really simply being a part of the conversation as an alternative if any of these suitors who might be interested in Raw end up not getting it. You know, looking at this other professional wrestling product that draws very good ratings for its price um, and ultimately what a bidding war means for AEW and how much it would improve its value. Yeah, in in this whole um, breakdown uh, in any analysis report, they also have like, the cost per, per viewer where you're taking mm -hmm. the rights fees and dividing it by how many viewers that brings AEW is something like, like the second lowest. It's like 37 cents per viewer, something in that range. It's extremely low. They are a huge bargain. Even if you were to give them a sizable increase, which would be enormous for AEW. And the, the whole key to getting an increase is multiple bidders. And if Fox can be one of those, that's great news for AEW. I don't know if Fox Sports would necessarily be interested in the entire package. And and I would not look at it as Fox Network, but rather for FS1, mm -hmm. AEW content would fit in seamlessly on an FS1. And I could certainly see them. Like Tony Khan seems very, very married to uh, uh, Warner Brothers Discovery. And we certainly got have gotten at least a bit more insight from Tony Khan that there is obviously some kind of stake that Warner Brothers Discovery has in the company, but he has stayed like he has complete uh, control of, of the company and voting power. But that ties in a bit more than just a simple like licensing fee if W Warner Brothers Discovery actually has some kind of stake in the company. And are we entirely um, sure that AEW can't break up their properties? You know, maybe, maybe there's or... no like it's. Yeah. Keep you, a collision you, on a Turner and then maybe Donna might move somewhere else. I mean, you know, who's to say they can't do that? These are all like possibilities. But for AEW, like it would be great news if they believe that Fox still is open to the idea of being in the wrestling business. They still got a program their their Friday nights. And again, I, I don't see AEW being put on Fox, but mm -hmm. you, you can't discount anything at this point um, in, yeah. in terms of like where the the cost of programming is and what they, what would the difference be of taking a dynamite and putting it in so many million more homes on, on a Fox and, and what they could command. And again, the scheduling is of, of, of interest too, especially in, in, in regards to raw, you know, is Monday going to be the optimal time for a lot of these suitors to p place that show? And if Monday is available, well, what does that mean for the competition as well? One year from now, the wrestling schedule could be, like a bomb could be thrown on it and just everything is on different nights and it, like different networks, like so much could change by the time we're talking next year. Uh, over to Dana White news. And he spoke to sports business journal and he was asked about the UFC's Saudi Arabia deal. And what was the key to getting this deal done? And he said, quote, it was Vince McMahon. It was 100% Vince McMahon. He made every call. He didn't make one move without picking up the phone and calling me and getting me in the loop and seeing if I was cool with this and that. And he went from being, oddly enough, I don't know why, an enemy of ours to being an unbelievable, incredible partner. Dude, this Dana White media run and his description <laughs> of Vince McMahon, it's like 
this man who has like kept it all in all these years, <laughs> this obvious like, like here's a guy in Dana White that my God, you sneeze in his direction and he would tear you apart in an online video. And here's Vince McMahon that legitimately stopped major business deals from occurring for him. And Dana always, always just deferred to the great Vince McMahon publicly. And now he's in business with them. And he's like telling all the tales out of school about, man, this, this guy used to be such a prick. Let me tell you a few examples, but he's great now. And yes, giving them all the credit for the Saudi Arabia deal. And you you got your answer way that it sounds like Vince is a pick up the phone kind of guy, not so much uh, send the emojis. Hard to tell you the, the beat by beat of a Saudi Arabia negotiation with emojis. Right, right. Um, well, maybe, maybe, um, maybe Dana has a, an emoji next to Vince's name in his contacts book. So maybe an emoji does pop up, and I wonder which emoji he would choose. Hard to hard to imagine. Well, the man with the mustache, obviously. Oh, that's <laughs> writes itself right Close. there. Yes, but Dana, you guys might have to do um, uh, get some of your fighters to talk about Air Saudia. Okay, <laughs> that's very good, by the way, John. Beginning of the year where these two men were in the public eye to us talking about this story right now, seeing this photo of the two of them standing together, um, more money than either have ever had at any point in their lives, uh, face completely public, you know, no repercussions to anything that, you know, they, they were facing beforehand. I mean, I guess with Vince, it remains to be seen, but did you maybe expect, you know, this sort of turnaround by November of this year? For Vince, I mean, by by the time the year started, we I'm trying to remember when I, I think it was still a few weeks into January that we got all the, the details of what went on over like late December into the new year about him elbowing his way back into control. I would say like pre knowledge of that, I I had a hard time imagining that scenario playing itself out like that was a hard one to believe Dana with the slap. I thought it was. My impression was that this is going to kill power slap. And number two, this is going to greatly diminish his, um, his public profile for the UFC. And I was wrong on both accounts, like power slap. It had the one week delay and Dana, however, it, you it, it did greatly diminish it. Now we can argue how successful it would have been at all. Um, but I, I would definitely say it, it took a big hit. Um, no pun intended. I would say he took a hit among those that maybe were already critical or look at the UFC in a certain light that that is something that's not going to escape him. But I would say to his base and it's, there's a great amount of them like in terms of UFC business. And I, I was more speaking about power slap. Uh, oh, with power slap. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I'm just talking about like the, like the video with his wife. I think that that um, mm -hmm. like to his audience, it was, he addressed it at a press conference and that was the extent of whatever his public uh, penance had to be. And, you know, explaining to people, I'm like, there's no punishment that I need to take because I have to live with the fact that I, I did that. That's the punishment. And dude, he, he came out of it unscathed. Like, I think that's just, it is Rang the bell on, Wa on wall street. Yeah. Vince McMahon, it will be a very interesting year to watch Vince McMahon and what his involvement is in terms of real power in TKO. And is this guy going to be like just a public figure that is there to almost be like a representative of the company? Like we have never seen this guy just thrown out there as like, here is our representative of TKO that's speaking to media scrums and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like, are we going to see Vince in more of a role? Like here he is as just our guy to be out in public and the, and the heavy lifting is going to be done by the Ari Emanuels and, and Nick Kant. Well, this is really the first case we're hearing publicly of his direct involvement in the UFC's business, isn't it? He's not just a figurehead, you know, representing the WWE branch. He really is, I guess, you know, really helping out both sides. And th th listen, I'm sure this is an, an enormous deal for the UFC. So mm -hmm. if Vince McMahon gets public credit for that, I mean, that's, you know, that's significant. Wh whatever your, your personal thoughts are, like for a revenue generator, that's incredible for the UFC. Uh, and Dana White also announced several big fights for the beginning of next year. He announced Sean Strickland and Drickus Duplessis for January the 20th. 
which is expected to be uh, their return to Toronto for the UFC 297 pay-per-view. This was, um, Drickus Duplessis was supposed to get the middleweight title fight back in September, but he fought in July and they he couldn't turn around in, I think it was about eight weeks time. So he lost the fight. Sean Strickland got in and won the title. And then Drickus Duplessis was like in the doghouse until they need a date to fill. And now all of a sudden, well, now you get the title fight. You're back in. February, they're going to be doing Alexander Volkanovsky, who just got stopped by Islam Makachev. So this is a uh, a bit of an uncomfortable quick turnaround for him. Uh, taking on Ilya Taporia, who is a monster at 145 pounds. He's undefeated and uh, 6-0 and in the UFC and just demolished Josh Emmett. So that fight is happening in February. And in March, we'll have a rematch between Sean O'Malley and Marlon Vera. Vera being the only fighter to have beaten Sean O'Malley in his career back in 2020. And uh, O'Malley significantly improved since that last fight. But those are three big title fights that they've announced for the first quarter of 2024. Okay. Just Boom, thrown out. Dana just breaks these fights now on Instagram. He just hits play. What's up, all you guys? Big fight coming up. No dates announced for these, uh, by the way. Just says in January, in February, in March. Like, no dates, no locations. Just here we go. I don't know if I've heard you do a Dana before. It's been a while. You just, uh, hmm. you, just you know, you just got to yell. I can't get the red going in my head. Yeah, so right. I'll work on that one. Over the weekend, Katsuhiko Nakajima, he won the Triple Crown from Yuma Aoyagi. This match was incredible. If there's a match to really seek out this weekend, like I will say, Osprey and Shota Umino was like at another level than anything I saw this weekend, but this was number two. This match, look at this venue, Wade. Like they had like under 800 people here. It looked like they were in a bowling alley somewhere. And I'm watching just this unbelievable match. It was somewhat scary at times with the suplexes they were taking on their necks. And dude, the striking exchanges in particular from Nakajima. Like we talk about that wind up slap that Kenta does. There's one in this match that Nakajima does. And I swear to God, I thought that Aoyagi's head was going to come off when he connected. It was unreal. And then one with the Northern lights bomb and, you know, a semi surprising finish that they put the triple crown on him and he will defend the title against Kento Miyahara on new year's Eve. So Either Nakajima is coming into New Japan or to All Japan, or he is just coming in for a quick run with All Japan. He could lose the title at, at New Year's Eve, and then his 2024 is uh, set up. But he could be going freelancer. He could end up in New Japan. Um, we will see where he lands. But I think he's one of the more interesting names to watch in 2024. And this was a um, an indication that he's at least uh, coming back for this match with Kento Miyahara. This is a rematch from July, which. Nakajima won as well. And this this should be outstanding as well. The first match was great. Other than Osprey, maybe, maybe um I would say the hottest male, maybe uh uh you know, free agent that might be out there at the moment. And uh seems like he's at least so you don't get the sense this is any sort of permanent stay in all Japan pro wrestling, and you think this will just be a shorter stint? I don't know. It, it could be either one. I it doesn't make a whole ton of sense to me that if you're Nakajima, you're leaving Noah and you're going to all Japan. Like it's like that. At best, it's a lateral move, and realistically, like it's a it, it it's it's a move back, just in terms of like if you've been in Noah all these years and you finally are breaking out and going somewhere, don't you want to kind of test yourself and and where you can make the most money or be seen by the most people, at least in Japan? And like, there's there's one place for that. And man, if you're looking at a year where Osprey is probably leaving, like New Japan needs some fresh names that can be just jettisoned to the main event picture. And Nakajima could come in day one and lay out Naito. That would be my New Year's dash angle, if not the Tokyo Dome. Like Nakajima coming in and boom. Taking his moment, right? That would be a great introduction for Nakajima. So um, yeah. Do you have any thoughts? Uh, this is uh, PWInsider.com's report that WWE seems very interested in, in Julia. And I think like this is something to watch, too, is, you know, you have WWE that is really returned to big acquisition mode. And, you know, you look in Japan and a lot of these talents like there are going to be big demands for all your top talent. And that's it, it's going to be tough because the, the role of a stardom in New Japan, it's going to be constant recreating or creating new stars because i think there's going to be a lot of names that are going to be getting interest from abroad it doesn't so much surprise me i mean you know with stardom talents i'm not exactly sure like how their contracts work or like if there's a certain time that they're available but um it certainly doesn't surprise me that they see crossover appeal you know for for julia of um a lot of stardom members um 
I'm surprised to hear that maybe talks are uh, as advanced as reported, you know, that, that yeah, she no, may no be report in. that like any deal is done. Just that right. it seems like they are very interested. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've only just started to see her it maybe dip her toe into the waters of wrestling in North America. So the, the idea that she might make a permanent stay, uh, you know, in the WWE or really any sort of promotion on, on this side of the, of the, the, the ocean is, uh, a little bit surprising, you know, uh, obviously a great wrestler, but, um, her English is very limited. And as always, when it comes to Japanese talent, you wonder like what the ceiling is, but I mean, we they've seen success with a lot of you know Japanese talents at this point. Um, obviously, Io, Asuka, Kyrie to an extent, and I, I would be certain they could accomplish a whole lot with Julia. All right, we'll just finish up with the ratings notes. SmackDown back on Fox on Friday. This was the taped show. Did two million one hundred nineteen thousand viewers and a point five three. So this would be their lowest on Fox since September the eighth, which was the last episode they didn't have John Cena on. They were against a Knicks uh, Milwaukee Bucks game as well as a uh, game between Boston College and Syracuse Rampage. Did two hundred ninety eight thousand viewers and a point one one in the demo. So the good news was the demo was up twenty three percent this week and their highest in several weeks. The viewership was down thirteen percent and this would be the second lowest viewership for an episode of Rampage in its regular time slot ever uh, behind the June 9th episode. So the viewership was uh, nothing great, but their their younger audience it 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 performed you know above usual levels. So you can take that. However you will. This had Daniel Garcia and Trent Beretta in the main event, as well as that three-way with Commander, Penta, and the Kingo on Friday night. And then NXT on Tuesday night, we have the first qualifying matches in the Iron Survival Challenge with Tiffany Stratton against Fallon Henley, Tyler Bate against Dijak, and then Braun Breaker taking on Von Wagner, as Wagner has man, made an incredible recovery. Two weeks ago, he couldn't even pull the band, and now he's... Uh, he, he is going in, though. His head is not 100%, as we saw last Tuesday. He was still holding his head, so we could get a, um, I don't know, like Shawn Michaels uh, collapse at the end. And he's got some of those, uh, you know, Seth Rollins back recovery powers. Yeah, but it's his head. Uh, and then Noam Dar defending the Heritage Cup against Akira Tozawa. A monumental week. Two Akira Tozawa matches advertised in advance between Raw and NXT this week. And the return after one week off of Lyra Valkyria to speak. Dynamite on Wednesday night has MJF Daniel Garcia for the AEW title, Samoa Joe versus Keith Lee for the ROH TV title, Swerve against Penta, Jay White versus Mark Briscoe, the return of Red Velvet, who's been out since February, taking on Julia Hart, and just announced tonight, Sting and Darby Allen against the Outrunners in what Tony Khan has stated will be Sting's first match in the state of Oregon since January the 12th, 1989, when he took on Ric Flair. Okay, maybe his last match in the state of Oregon. Probably his last match in the state of Oregon. But dude, Sting's doing two matches this week because on, what? Co on Collision, it's Sting, Adam Copeland, and Darby against Lance Archer and The Righteous, which is being taped Friday in Oakland to air Saturday on Collision. Interesting. Okay, so, I mean, really... Um pick it up the pace here with this uh sting retirement tour you know not wasting i guess any so and he's got the pay-per-view match in just a couple of weeks too so and congrats outrunners for getting one of those spots i mean I i'm imagining this, this is not going to be the most <laughs> intensive match this no. should probably be um quick mm -hmm. but yeah probably probably his last match in the state of uh oregon so is rick flair gonna be there i well he should be i would think like uh i mean you do have two years though to um fit him into different programs this thing will be gone by then yeah you're right well listen they signed him to two years i didn't okay. well maybe he'll have a woo energy before his match i guess those will be on sale uh asap mm -hmm. people can report back all right you can go to uh, postwrestling.com the whole schedule is there for the week but we will have uh, plenty of coverage this week uh we are back with a new edition of talk coming up this thursday that's correct yeah it's been a while since we've done uh, an edition of talk it's the show where john and i simply talk um very self-explanatory show uh, sometimes we talk about sometimes some of you who are brand new to us are complaining why don't you guys get to the wrestling review already why don't you guys get to the wrestling talk stop talking about your daily lives stop talking about you know how much you've uh yeah uh, uh, how much you've forgot your uh your 
your uncle's wallet or <laughs> whatever st story that John was trying to spoiler tell that's going to be the first 20 minutes <laughs> talk is a show where we only talk about that stuff so it's um uh, I, dude, I totally bla i thought you were just randomly bringing something up i was like no that was an actual story last yeah. week. yeah you're right <laughs> yeah, you're right uh and it's it's actually one of our very most popular shows um on the post wrestling cafe so people who uh seem to like us like it a lot and we will be talking about whatever comes to mind on thursday this week okay um a, sp a programming note is that this week up next will be going live wednesday at 1 p.m. with Braden and a guest co-host John Ceno. So that will be Wednesday instead of the usual Tuesday night uh, for those two. And then Brandon Thurston and I will go live Wednesday at 3 Eastern with a whole uh, rundown of the TKO Q3 earnings report and my favorite, the call with all of the analysts afterwards. So we will go through who speaks on the first ever TKO earnings call. Could be Dana and Vince. You might have to break up two both impressions. I think we all expect Ari Emanuel. I'm going to say yes on Nick Khan. I still I still will lean yes that we at least get some like remark from a Vince McMahon. I think for this first one, I think he's on there. It's very mm. brief, but he, maybe maybe they have like the whole gang there for the first one. I don't know, but this call is going to be um what watch it's going to be like nothing. You'll get the whole Wu-Tang Clan showing up on this first first show of the tour. Yeah. I I can't wait for uh things of that nature. Now take it over, Nick. On to Raw tonight from Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. The sight of uh, Vince McMahon exploding in a limousine once. That was a um, that was a very um, unfortunate, I guess. Uh, po week? Pretty, pretty uh, period. Poorly. Yeah, I remember. I remember like seeing the explosion and thinking like this is just nuts. And then the next week they did like the tribute show. Mm -hmm. Do you remember this? Yeah. I and do. I was like, this feels very icky. Like they took the the like Owen Eddie Guerrero template show and applied it to a storyline of Vince's death with the people doing like the sit down testimonials and the ten bell salute and I don't know it was it was kind of gross and then days later was the Benoit stuff and mm -hmm. Vince had to come back to life. On that note, we get into tonight's edition of Raw and we start off with a recap video of Crown Jewel. A little thing, did you notice the way they positioned it of Rollins and Drew McIntyre as like the main event that was featured last in the video rundown? I'll be honest, I totally skipped the recap, but um, that's that's not that surprising. Adam sure. Pierce on his avid. Uh, Seth Rollins comes out to start the show. Thanks, Drew McIntyre. He was a man of his word, not in bed with the Judgment Day, and calls out Sami Zayn to thank him for helping him thwart Damian Priest. And they explain that Adam Pierce made Sami Zayn give back the briefcase. Yes. So after all that, he just got the briefcase back without any kind of a struggle. Well, he did like, you know, um, uh, basically nullify the, the cash in attempt. But I was actually happy to see that they're not going to do some long drawn out like, hey, I got your briefcase, you know, like I'm going to have it for an entire month and it's up to you to try to chase it back from me. I mean, honestly, we're seeing it with MJF and Jay White. It's a pretty tired storyline. So I'm glad to see that they just... Like, why isn't, why isn't Tony Khan telling Jay White to just give it back? Um, well, he doesn't have the authority of an Adam Pierce. Right. Okay. Zane explains that the reason I did that was because I've been dealing with the Judgment Day for months. They hold every title except for the World Championship. If they win that, then they become Bloodline 2.0, which I fear will be the name of a group down the line. Bloodline 2.0. <laughs> Let's not add 2.0 to anything. I think we've learned our lesson. Yeah. Rollins explains, I run Raw, not Judgment Day. He spoke to Pierce, and he wants to give Sami Zayn a title shot. Just say when. And Zayn says that I'm going to win that title one day, but I want to beat a champion that is not compromised. I know you're not 100% right now. And Rollins says, we're wrestlers. We're never 100%. We don't have health care. He says, just say when. And Zayn says, well... As you know, as us independent contractors, we no longer get these big pay-per-view payoffs any longer. So I'm not going to say Survivor Series. Let's pop a number. Let's pop a quarter. I say tonight. And Seth is like, oh, shit. Tonight? <laughs> and he uh, he agrees afterwards. Like, he like had this shocked look on his face. Like, why wouldn't he say yes? He just said, your back's all screwed up. Of course, I'm going to pick tonight. So that is our main event for tonight. And uh, this was certainly not a bait and switch. They gave you the whole title match and you got a big 20 minute main event between these two that they built up all show long.
I mean, I was certainly fully expecting a DQ finish or, um, I mean, you did, you, did we get a completely clean finish? Yeah, we did. You got a, totally a clean, clean finish. finish. Yeah. Yeah. So I was expecting certainly, um, you know, some shenanigans and we did not get it. Uh, we did not get any interruptions. They, they promised us a, a big pay-per-view level match and they gave it to us, which, um, I, mean, I feel like, uh, um, this happens where like, I should really be happy about it. But for whatever reason, like, but I'm not because I'm actually just more of a fan of like anticipation and it being built for my big professional wrestling matches. I need three days to get ready for a big title match. On I need a reason to get rid of my money, you know, in, in order to really enjoy something is what I'm trying to say. So, um, but this will be like something we will be talking about at the conclusion of, of, of the recap here. Of should they have hot shot at this match? We cut to the back. Damian Priest is furious that Sami Zayn was just gifted a title shot, but he does have the briefcase back. And a JD is there. He's wearing a Damian Priest shirt, which yeah. I guess exists now. And dude, this was just so great. Just how Damian Priest notices this. Did you buy that shirt? <laughs> like, I better be getting the royalties off this shirt. It was just great the way he like calmly asked him this. And JD said he he picked it up from the locker room and J uh, because Priest didn't want it, which I don't know if is the right answer you want to give. You know, and uh, and just like that, he leaves with Balor. They got to make things right around here, and we're gonna get uh, Damian Priest and Finn Balor against New Day. But uh, this was big twenty minute start to Raw. I really do continue to love the uh, JD and and Damian Priest relationship, and how JD is still really trying to suck up to the to the man and trying to get in his good graces, even though we all know, um, he deserves to be in the Judgment Day at this point. Come on. It's also a balancing act that they're doing. And given the buildup now to war games, he's going to be more pronounced, that being mm. JD. But like him and Dominic, they are sort of these similar characters, right? Like not they're not entirely. Dominic's a lot more like kind of chicken shit heel, whereas JD, you really get the sense he gets beaten up a lot. But you also like, I, I maybe I'm just thinking about his NXT character, but he's also somebody who's also like a lot more maybe thought out and, and, and thoughtful and, and nefarious behind the scenes. They haven't introduced the cerebral stuff, like the crazy stuff he was doing in NXT. But I, I, to that point, though, I'm stating like I feel they have like differentiated the two where it could right. easily become like here are the two kind of, you know, weak mm -hmm. links of the of the judgment day. But they are different enough. And I'm kind of curious to see now that they have this uh, this war games to build up to like what they do with uh, JD, because I think the big the big reveal is eventually like JD comes through in the clutch with something mm -hmm. big going into this. Mm -hmm. Balor and Priest against the New Day. I don't know what's gotten into the New Day, man, but they are just like I, I think they're having like one of their best like runs of just consistent good matches. And I thought this was another one. This was a fast paced nine minutes they had stereo Topicon Heroes by Woods and Kingston, and then Kingston evades the South of Heaven, hits the boom drop. There's a superplex top rope elbow by New Day, and then Priest is sent to the floor. Kofi gets caught with a flatliner on the desk, and after Priest. Uh, nails Woods from the floor. He's sent into a sling blade, then a South of Heaven and the Coup de Grace as Balor pins Woods in nine minutes, 10 seconds, and a non-title victory for the Judgment Day. But I like this match. Mm. Yeah, I thought it was a good match. I mean, I really think the New Day have always been consistent, but um, I'd be very hard-pressed to name, like, too many memorable matches that they've had. Not and involving the Usos. Yeah, maybe Brian Danielson. I mean, there are some pretty good Viking Raiders matches, I suppose, or at least like Ivar matches, and you know, uh, with, with these guys recently. But it always feels like such a stop and start when it comes to actual story building. Um, and I, I just get the sense the new day at this point are just back to nothing. You know, creative has nothing for them. I mean, they spent last week dressing up as the the Judgment Day to build up to this match, uh, and beyond that, I. I don't see any sort of aspirations for a ch another title tag title reign because who wants to see a, a challenge for 15th tag title reign? Um, nor really kind of like any um, sort of attempt at, at creating anything fresh or new, you know, um, to, to, to stories to tell with the with the two of them. So they're just kind of in a role, at least on this show, as a stepping stone or a showcase match for the Judgment Day. Kofi Kingston, we go back to that week after he lost the title. And that object he had in his hand that he was squeezing. Was it a donut or something? Something like that. And yeah. now he finally goes after Brock. Just, just, just brings back the donut, the crushed donut. Yeah. He's had four okay. years to contemplate. Oh, that's that's still a match that's out there. Yeah, it's sure. still there. The rematch. We're all waiting for it. <laughs> 
So then we have uh, Jackie Redman earlier today goes up to Drew McIntyre and asks him after Crown Jewel, what's next? And he just looks at Jackie and said, I flew all the way from Saudi Arabia to Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and uh, I'm going home. He says nothing. He just gets in and drives away. He actually pulled, like parked, he parked. He got out of this car to say nothing. And then and got back away. into the car and drove away. So that's a long um, travel day. Well, this is like Jack Briscoe who got to like the, the airport and it was just all like the snow was coming down. And he told Jerry, I'm done. And that was it. He never wrestled again. He just got on a flight to go home. And that was it. Didn't even stop for catering. Didn't stay, stay to say hi to anybody. Nothing. It was so. a long travel for him. Well, I mean, hey, he's a man with a lot on his mind, especially after um, Saturday. So may maybe he just had a, you know, a bit of a sort of a flash mid interview here and just decided, fuck this. I'm going home. kind of um, I would say coming out of tonight sort of feels like odd man out. Like he's not involved in this war games and mm. he's kind of off to the side, but he is still tied to like the Judgment Day stuff. Um, and that's okay. Like he could be like, he just had a, a title match. Like he really had, I, I would say a big chapter in his personal story. Um, I hate that overusing that phrase at this point, but he failed. He failed in his final attempt really to try to get relevant and to become a champion one last time. So he's on the precipice of a major character change. You would think. And I think it's okay for him to take a bit of time off before we're coming back and actually, you know, debuting something completely new. See, I think from um, just given like his tie-ins to the Judgment Day and Jay Uso, I think there's something. There's an interesting story there of Drew being on the babyface side, and yeah. whether he has to team with Jay or is he going to align with the Judgment Day. Um, yes, totally. I wouldn't even disqualify the idea he somehow gets involved in in this match because he's just like that's that's an interesting story that you're still playing. I very much agree with you. I also felt it was interesting how Seth in the opening segment of tonight's show um, specifically decided to thank Drew McIntyre. Now, if they were really going full along with like a Drew McIntyre heel turn, I don't know if that's necessarily something you would script for like your lead baby face to say, like it was a very sort of sincere, thank you, Drew McIntyre for, you know, helping me level up basically. Um, so I do wonder if they are continuing to like, was that tweener phase just a one month thing, but they're leaving it. I don't think so. Certainly. I think from this, I think you clearly see him, uh, continuing this but could he ultimately revert back to just to being a baby face um then he has to forgive jay uso for that mm -hmm. that unspeakable act that um in wales last year <laughs> yeah he watched the footage finally realized jay wasn't there what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> solo <laughs> shinsuke nakamura against akira tozawa we had seven days to get ready for this uh otis and gable are in the corner and Michael Cole, to give us a uh, to give Tozawa a fighting chance, he goes over his accolades and does note Tozawa has been a champion in the past. Okay, was he was the cruiserweight champion, all right? Which is at least like has a bit more legitimacy than the, the twenty four. It's not even a belt anymore. Well, neither is the twenty four seven, but he, nonetheless, he was a do you champion. Think to, do you think Michael Cole was thinking about the cruiserweight title when he mentioned this? I I don't know what the Cole's thinking. Maybe he's thinking about Dragon Gate. Cole never you watched two hundred five live. So he says, uh, this is also his seven-year anniversary of coming to the U.S. Uh, Tozawa does counter a powerbomb off the buckle into a Rana. Tozawa did look good here. I was kind of critical of uh, his performance a few weeks ago, but he did look good in his two minutes to shine here. Uh, avoids a Kinshasa, gets a roll-up, and then can, uh, Nakamura with the boot and Kinshasa in two and a half minutes. Uh, this was almost 2.05. No, wow. yeah, he, he got a few extra seconds. I thought, I mean, the two minute TV match, I, I thought this was pretty good. You know, it, they worked a very fast and exciting pace. Tazawa is actually one of the fastest guys on the roster, but you never think about his matches because they're only two minute matches on TV and they're almost always just of him like getting beaten up. But they, it looked like they put, they made this one feel a bit more special than usual. And it was, to my surprise, the first time Nakamura and Tazawa have ever had a match together. Both oh. of them really like debuting around the same time in, in 2016. So one person was at the they've, very... they've been saving it for, for this <laughs> night. One person, was, one person was one person was at like pretty like high up in the card and the other person was on 205 live and, and the 24 seven division trying to stay relevant. So that kind of explains it, but nonetheless, like um, it's rare to see like I, I so 
I actually looked this up, and I don't think Nakamura's ever wrestled another Japanese wrestler during his time in the WWE, and Tozawa has it since Hideo Itami in 2018. So wow, this was a, a bit special for that reason, I guess. Otis comes into the ring, faces off with Nakamura, and then Nakamura bails and walks to the back. Pierce gives an address about the four-way match tonight, the winner to take on Gunther at Survivor Series in Chicago. And then Seth Rollins meets with Pierce. Adam Pierce was in about a dozen segments on this show. And Pierce asks him, th this was hilarious because 15 minutes before they put up the graphic and state, it's official, Seth Rollins and Sami Zayn for the title. And then we go to this backstage segment and Pierce asks him, are you sure you want to do this? Like, what does official mean? When we say the match is official and then you give them an out here. Um, Back out. Well, I, uh, maybe, maybe there's just a clause, you know. This is like, um, you know, you, you put tickets on sale for two ninety five, and then John Jones gets hurt. It's like, mm. it was official. Then they mention, uh, for the first time, we get an update on Eric. Stay. He went. He went under. He underwent a uh, neck fusion surgery. So that was our first update that we'd heard on on Eric during this whole time, and that takes us into the four way with Ivar, Bronson Reed, Ricochet, and the Miz, and. I mean, they had some spectacular stuff in this match, and we got to see uh, the Miz auditioning for like the best of the Super Juniors next year. I mean, this was Miz pulling out all his his baby face fire that he could muster. Mm -hmm. He and, went enter the uh, um um uh, what is it? Uh, what's the PWG tournament tournament? Oh, Bola, Bola, yeah. Sign Miz Miz go doing Bola would be. Uh, I almost feel like it's kind of. It would actually be great. Okay, it, oh no, I'm saying it would be. I would say like at the at the height of like that tournament. I don't know if it's quite at the same level, but dude, like the Miz showing up unexpectedly at a at a game changer show would just be oh, it'd like, be Matt Cardona be, times ten. He would be received so lovingly by well, they'd boo him, they'd throw trash, but like secretly they'd love him. Yes, yeah, that would be that would be something. So. Reed and Ivar just collide with one another on the floor. We go through a break. There's a Tower of Doom with Miz and Ricochet launching the monsters, and we get a shot of Gunther just smiling in the back. Miz hits a DDT, and the place goes nuts, and Michael Cole yells, I can't remember the last time Miz has looked this good. I mean, it, it was like a little kind of bit of a fancier, you know, tilt-a-whirl type of DDT. So well, This is our former world champion. I can't remember the last time this guy looked good. There's a recoil on Miz. Ivar splashes both. And then Ricochet tries for the Benadriller. It's stopped. Skull Crushing Finale gets stopped. And then we get a double down as they both hit big boots. As, oh, we, uh, okay, we, we skimmed over the insane spot here where Ricochet is draped on the top rope. Bronson Reed then jumps onto the bottom rope and mm. flips Ricochet up off the top rope where he rotates into a Rana onto Ivar and then Ricochet, the way he came down. I mean, this was, this was nearly perfect, but man, he can't, he comes right down on his neck, which like folds after hitting this. The idea of coming up with this was insane. They must've tried this out beforehand because this could have just gone way more wrong um, than just a, a neck issue at the end. But my God, this looked nuts. It was, it was a bit scary, but I mean, he was fine. Continued the match and, you know, didn't, he seemed a little like shaken. Like, he, like the yeah. way he came down, like he comes down right on the neck. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, continued. And like the match went like another 10 minutes after the spot, but the ending sees, Ricochet and Miz down on the mat from the from the boots, and then Ivar climbs one turnbuckle. Bronson Reed climbs the other. Ivar hits a moonsault onto Ricochet, while Reed misses the tsunami to Miz. So you have Ivar trying to pin Ricochet, and Miz is on top of Reed as the referee is counting both shoulders down, and then Ricochet kicks out at two, and the count continues with Miz getting the pinfall on Bronson Reed. There is no music that plays. Michael Cole is adamant. It was a double pin. They both pinned each other. And Wade Barrett, who has decided, <laughs> I am not going to sound like an idiot here. It's like, no, dude. There was absolutely a kick out here by Ricochet. And, dude, even the way Samantha Irvin announced 
Miz as the winner. Like this seemed to me like this was supposed to be a, a double pin, but I just don't know how that would have been messed up like that. Yes, yes, it was certainly odd, and um, it and they left... are doing the rematch next week as well. Right. So, uh, what I think kind of gave it away that something was screwed up was how awkward the referee was acting throughout this entire finish. Like it was almost as if the referee. Well, first of all, the referee didn't even note to i guess the bell ringer or the announcer that like whoever won and when the when they started announcing the name the referee was like you know visibly sh trying to like wave it off like he was just trying to trying to say this is not no, Mary, not, it, not it clearly cole i guess cole must have known like what the plan was because yeah. he's clearly calling this as it's a double pin and and the, the the announcer must have like had word from the back to just hey like ricochet kicked out like call miz as the winner and Anyway, I'm sure we'll find out, you know, tomorrow morning about like what actually happened here. But I mean, for all we know, it was just going to be the double pin and they were going to do the singles match next week and they're just going to do it anyway. But there's still a lot of questions. Like, oh, there's plenty. Yeah. I mean, this this was a mess. Like, why? Why is why, there a rematch? Why did Ricochet kick out at two? If it was supposed to be a double pin, it was very strange. It was very strange. Yeah. And, and beyond that, um, was all of this afterwards with Ivar attacking the Miz just, uh, improvised and, and was it all inaudible, you know, because you could also see the referee as Miz was celebrating here, you know, referee is kind of like telling the Miz, Dude, Miz hey, sold this, like, Hey, he, he did what you should have done here. He's it almost, like, it was almost like the referee was giving him an instruction. Hey, like, you know, watch out for the, you know, he's going to move sell to you, blah, 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 blah. And if all of that was improvisation, uh, just to kind of fix this entire thing to get to Ivar versus the Miz. I mean, that's, they deserve a, a round of applause for thinking on their feet, you know, to try to fix it. But anyway, it's, it's all a really interesting sort of live TV, like weird thing that happened here. It was very odd. Um, not enough. Like I, I thought it was a really entertaining four way, just like a really mm, uh, confusing ending. But they, I mean, Ricochet looked great in here. The audience was really into the Miz. Like they certainly have something here in this like babyface Miz run that the audience is like. It's, oh. It doesn't even feel like it's ironically getting behind him. It just seems like they they like getting behind oh. him in this match. And oh. you had two great bases in Reed and Ivar. All they had to do to make the Miz get a babyface reaction was to have him do a bit more than the bare minimum in ring. Okay. Um, and, and that already was like, wow, like this is a brand new version of the Miz. You'd be meanwhile, Ricochet is like, you know, doing all these flips and like almost landing on his head. Everything he does is like that spectacular. Watch this. It's a tilt world DDT. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but it's, I, I, it'll work, you know, like he I did not see him pinning Bronson Reed as a outcome in this match. Mm, yeah. So Ivar just attacks him, hits a moonsault off the top. And then later they would announce Ivar versus Miz for next week. Tozawa apologizes to Otis and Gable. They state, it's okay. We were worried about you going into the deep end with all these opponents, and they are going to go to NXT Tuesday night to support him in his quest to win the Heritage Cup from Noam Dar. Definitely a step down, uh, you know, in terms of uh, NXT integration after Becky, you know. Um, what are you talking I love about? Tozawa, like, and, and Alpha Academy is great too, but, I mean, they, they haven't necessarily advertised somebody to sort of replace that same level of star power. Maxine comes in. She's getting ready for her battle royal, her follow-up match after her debut on TV months ago. Yeah. The Creeds and Ivy Nile are there signing their contracts. I believe a uh, Brutus uh, Creed was married over the weekend. Oh, so, so two contracts he signed. He signed, yes. Uh, he wow. signed a lot. Quite, the, quite a busy few days for him. So they signed with Raw. So we don't really have some long uh, free agent period for these two. They just uh, signed them right away. Aldous had no interest in them, I guess. Uh, I, I guess not. <laughs> Didn't even try. We, we don't know if there's a bidding more. Well, Pierce says, I'm happy that you're here on the flagship. I don't know what you guys would be doing over on Fridays. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, we don't know. <laughs> and DIY come in and we set up a match for next. The Creeds and Ciampa and Gargano here. So we have DIY working over Julius. Julius uh, continues with th this deadlift from the seated position as he uh, lifts up, uh, I believe it was Gargano. And then they uh, they try moonsaults off the apron. DIY sidesteps. We have all four down as uh, Gargano hits a dive and it's followed with a Brutus bomb. We come back from break right as Julius is missing with a 450 splash off the top. They double team Brutus. And then we see uh, Julius and Brutus come back with a standing shooting star, a standing moonsault. Ciampa's in for the save. And Ciampa saves Gargano from the Brutus ball. As Gargano hits a poison Rana, Ciampa's in with the Willow's Bell and a fairy tale ending. Julius kicks out. And then meeting in the middle is prevented when Brutus yanks Ciampa out 
and Ludwig Kaiser appears, nailing Gargano from the apron and sets up the Brutus Ball to pin Gargano in 940. Mm -hmm. Really strong match. You know, first of all, I love the matchmaking here. Both teams had their in-ring debuts last week, and tonight you put them together, and you even had like a nice little backstage skit to set it up. So it they both felt important going into this. Um, I thought Ciampa looked great in this. The man was moving so quickly, and whenever he wrestles now, I almost, unfortunately, like always kind of just get the sense that he might eventually get injured again. Um, so I'm just basically trying to say that I'm really appreciating, you know, anytime I get to see him in ring that I can, because I, I just have, oh man, I, 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 I the man's just had a lot of bad luck, you know, during, during his uh, main roster run. Um, I thought the creeds look great here too. Not as smooth as the veterans, but the athleticism is there. And clearly uh, by giving them the win, even though DIY was protected in the sort of a cheating finish here. Um, but it does tell me that they, they are seeing more in the creeds as a, as an investment right now. The Creeds should be booked on every live event, working with these guys, working with like Vinci and Kaiser, like put them in with all these different teams and just have them do your, your 15, 16 Alpha Academy. Like you have a lot of great, this is a time when we are seeing a growth of the, the tag teams. And I would like, these guys can benefit greatly from just like six months on the road with all these different teams and getting actual time at, at the house shows or even just this rematch, you know, um, because of this, you know, um, um uh, the Kaiser finish in involvement here. Like you, you could book this one again. There's a video on Sammy Zayn showing his loss at elimination chamber. And we see Zayn watching this as Jay Uso approaches and Sammy's like, ah, oh, that was then, you know, when you, uh, when, when, when Jay really did, uh, Jay did not attack him though. Oh, that's mm. right. That's right. He did not get involved in that mm. one. You're right. Um, Jay wishes him luck and uh, mentions that him and Cody have a rematch with the Judgment Day next week, and we can all be champions. Jackie catches up with Becky Lynch. She talks about the Battle Royal tonight, and she is approached by Nia Jax, who says that winning the Battle Royal will make me the happiest since I broke your face. And Becky laughs at this, stating, you know, after that, I went on to headline WrestleMania while you got fired. Truths. Um, painful true. truths. And uh, yeah, I believe this is the first interaction we've seen of these two since Nia's return. And uh, this is certainly a famed pairing. So we're bound to get you this. You realize match. that was five years ago we're talking about this, which wow. is probably the most famous involvement Nia Jax has had with anyone to this point. Sure. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's i'm sorry to say it but it's like a, a bigger match than usual i'm not gonna say it's it's a huge you know head pay-per-view headlining match but it's a pay-per-view worthy match with a sort of long-term opponent for becky lynch um that they could promote uh, well, they also tonight is clearly evidence like we are just trying to keep becky busy until rumbles rumble mania season so mm -hmm. she's got zaya lee and you can certainly do nia Jax in here somewhere Nia and Zaya, yeah, but Nia they and Zaya. But the long term, um, as they, you know, Becky continued to tease tonight was is Rhea Ripley, of course. So then uh, Byron Saxton catches up with uh, Chelsea Green and Piper Niven. They make fun of the people that are in the battle royal as charity cases, and then in come Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark, and uh, the punchline is Chelsea Green thinking Niven's got her back in the battle royal. And Niven says, it's every woman for themselves, as Stark says the same to Shayna Baszler. So we are now ready for the battle royal. Winner faces Rhea Ripley at the Survivor Series. And as Becky Lynch makes her entrance, Zia Lee, who was pissed because she didn't get booked in this battle royal. She's a, she's on the graphic here. In the corner. Well, why didn't she enter the match? I mean, that was her entrance, attacking Becky Lynch from behind. Yeah, but she didn't participate she, in the match. Well, she got ejected. She got she got told to leave because of is the that, attack. Is that a is that an elimination of a in the Adam Pierce can do whatever he wants. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Later in this match, I saw Nia Jax be eliminated and rip Ivy Nile off the apron and attack her. And they well, stated there's saw... no DQ in a battle royal. <laughs> yeah, but you gotta wait till the match starts, okay? That's the difference. All right, John. Oh, so Zia Lee should have waited another like minute and she would have been fine. She should have entered the match first. And and no, I mean there... no Candace LeRae in this either. Hmm. Okay. Uh, oh, she's actually, yeah, she's not built. Oh, I mean, listen, we don't have so much. She's injured. She she was attacked from the KO. They, no, they do have a, a reason for it last week with the Zia Lee attack. Yeah. So uh, we have Nia Jax, Katana Chance, Caden Carter, Chelsea, Piper Niven, Zoe Stark, Shayna Baszler, Nikki Cross, Ivy Nile, Maxine, Raquel Rodriguez, 
and Tegan Knox. Were you surprised there were this many females on the Raw roster? Yes, completely. Um, I mean, yes and no. And they have women to spare. <laughs> Did they? No Becky, no Zaya, no Candice. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm a little surprised because like how how many <laughs> Have we, how many have we actually seen in matches recently? You know, here's the question How many of these could viably face Rhea Ripley at a pay per view? Naya, um, the, the, the four that we just saw face Rhea Ripley at Crown Jewel, okay, outside of the four. Uh, I, listen, Piper Niven with maybe a lot of work, you know, without the tag team titles, maybe. Um, Ivy Nile tonight was was a good debut, but like, yeah, is she capable? Listen, they can put anybody they want. They're putting Zoe Stark in, so they did do a good job yeah. here with Ivy Nile. They didn't make her just like you know cannon fodder. She got several big eliminations, including uh, Natalia, um, and made it to the final four on on top of this. So um, Nikki Cross was my favorite part of this battle royal. She was just in her catatonic state, and then was thrown over by Jax and Raquel as they stare. And she just stayed in this trance for the entire match on the floor. Um, I would say for 80% of this match, I just, it was like a battle Royal and I was not into this at all. It was just battle Royal spots, but then it picked up once we got to like the final set here. Um, they did treat Ivy Nile pretty well here. As I mentioned, she eliminated Natalia Jax. They were doing the deal where Nia Jax is thrown out to the floor and she just sits there for like 10 minutes. And I thought, oh, we're going to do the overdone. Someone thinks they've won, but there's one person left. And they thankfully brought Nia back in before. And all of the women gang up and throw Jax out. And Niall is on the edge of the apron and gets yanked to the floor by Nia. No DQs in Battle Royals, as Michael Cole tells us. And that leaves us with Raquel, Baszler, and Stark, who fight on the edge. And Raquel is uh, sent off. She's holding onto the rope, but let's go. She's out. So Shayna Baszler, <laughs> trying to win this match, decides, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to German suplex Zoe Stark off the apron to the floor. Maybe this she one had... was not thought out, was it? For an elimination spot. Oh, it depends whose feet touch first. Well, okay. I guess she figured um, my feet will magically stick to the edge here. So she gave up on that. Then she applies the Kurafuda Clutch but then she lets go of that. We're like, wait a minute. That's not a better idea. So then she is super kicked and Stark DDTs her and eliminates Baszler in 15 minutes and 56 seconds that this battle royal lasted. Mm. Um, I would say the only other person that kind of stood out to me was a uh, Katana Chance that I, I think hmm. like her and Caden Carter, they're they're dramatically underutilized. Very much so. Like as a tag team there, first of all, the other than... Uh... I, uh, Isla Dawn and, and Alba Fire, like they're actually the. <laughs> oh, yeah, remember remember, them? remember yeah. them? Are they still putting a spell on the uh, tag titles? We uh, clearly we don't get yeah. frequent updates. They're I think just they put a spell here. on themselves from ever appearing on TV here. They're yeah, not even getting vignettes. Yeah. Um. But like, they're the only other like real tag team in the actual division. That's just not like two random people put together. So, I don't know what they're doing with them. If they're just letting them get more experience on on the house show circuit before you know actually push pushing them, but uh, nothing happening with those two. And beyond that, as an in-ring match, there, there was not much here to talk about. But I will say by the time they got to the end, this was like a women's match in like pretty deep into the show that the crowd was reacting really well to. The and last couple of minutes when they got to like the serious contenders, and, like it had a good ending. And and in a division where like none of these characters are over, I mean, that's more than I could say for any sort of singular pairing of any of these wrestlers. So they they, they don't have many characters that are over at, at the moment. And um, of the lot, I was surprised to see Zoe Stark get the call as um, Rhea Ripley's opponent for Survivor Series. Um, so, you know, she is probably like one of the least developed of like the four other women that, that face uh, Rhea on Saturday. So maybe they're using this chance to build her up on that level uh, on a show that's not really being sold by the Rhea match anyway. Yeah. I mean, once they got to the final two, like it would have, I mean, Basil's was the one that took the pinfall on Saturday. And they, like, if you watch that ending, like they totally saved Nia Jax and didn't mm -hmm. have her involved in the finish at all. I really thought that was the direction they would go with this one. It's almost like, why, why is Nia here if not to do the Rhea Ripley match? It might be Becky first. Maybe she even beats Becky, and then you get to Rhea that way. Possible. Uh, Jackie interviews Rhea Ripley, and she is confronted by Zoe Stark, who tells her her entire focus should be on her. She hit her with the Z360 at Crown Jewel, and if not for Nia, I'd be the champion. And Rhea just laughs at her, says, remember when I gave you that avalanche riptide? 
It's always like, yeah, that's that's true. Wade Barrett is uh, carrying his uh, Philadelphia Eagles uh, title belt. Available yeah. now. We just got to shoehorn these into every single broadcast. They're not even Ex in, like... No, they were in Pennsylvania. Here. Oh, they were. No, they were not in Philadelphia, but close enough in the right state. All right. Next week, four matches to alert everyone. We have The Miz and Ivar with... um. They didn't say, like, his shot is at stake or anything like that. We're just doing a rematch. Piper Niven against Tegan Knox, Otis against Nakamura, and the tag title match with the Judgment Day against Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso. They recap Solo Sokoa beating John Cena and the uh, the tease that could this be it for John Cena? Did you see his uh, Instagram post? I did not. He put up an image of uh, David Beckham playing his final game. Right. Okay. So he must have watched the documentary recently too. Yeah, I bet he does. Do you think he's like? Um, do you think he spends hours uh, cleaning his? Um, are you kidding me? Did you not area? Did you not watch Total Bellas? No, he's, he's David Beckham times ten wow. with his OCD. Are you kidding me? You got to take your shoes off when you're, you know, sitting in John Cena's house. I um, like that. I like that doc series quite a bit. Oh, I, and I love John Cena on Total Bellas. It was like the best heel four part movie. John Cena series on Netflix. That's what yeah. we want. Mm -hmm. Seth Rollins and Sami Zayn WWE Championship. Uh, Rollins has tape on his back, so uh, the back is shot in this match. And uh, early on, they explained Zayn had a chance to attack the back, but opted not to as a mental game that he is playing with Rollins. So we go through a commercial break. They escalate the striking. Crowd is chanting Sammy. And then Rollins hits a suicide dive. He's holding his back. Is the back in a hold up way? So Zayn then hits a Tope Con Hero, misses the Haluva kick. So Seth Rollins, he loosens up. The adrenaline gets going. And he is able to pull off a last ditch springboard swanton leap to his feet into a cabrata landing on Sami Zayn. And Wade notes that he's pushing himself through the pain of that lower back. Well, this is what superstar athletes do, John. You know, that's what, this is what separates the champions from. Maybe it's that impact you know. that just, you know, his back. It's like it's like, like calloused. It needs to take regular bumps to be uh, feeling. That's normal. what Kurt Angle said, right? That's what a lot of wrestlers have said. Like you, your back starts to kill you when you stop bumping. That's it. So there's a pedigree on the edge of the apron that, or a pedigree attempt that is turned into a back body drop. We go through a second break. Zayn hits the exploder. Haluva gets stopped with a super kick, hits the pedigree. Zayn kicks out. And then Zayn catches the stomp and applies a lion tamer until he goes into the traditional Boston crab. And as he pulls Rollins to the center, Rollins is able to maneuver his body to get out and hooks the legs of Zayn and catches him with the three count in 20 minutes and 36 seconds. And Zane, you see him go to the ref and he's, was that three? Like, yeah, that was, that was three, Sam. It was definitely three. And um, I, I thought like a really, really good match. It was, uh, I, I didn't think this was a uh, Rollins, Drew McIntyre level from a uh, crown jewel, but the crowd was into this. It was like, it was, it was a good, good raw main event. I, I considered it a pay-per-view quality main, like match on TV. I'm not necessarily saying pay-per-view quality main event, but like I felt it like these two were great together you know they're, they're two of the best wrestlers of their generation and i thought they were able to create a very athletic and, and exciting what was this 20 minute match yeah 20 yeah um i thought they you know did did a good job of reminding us of the lower back and uh they created some really great crowd reactions but i maybe trying to explain what the difference is for for you between this and the drew mcintyre match um you never at any point felt like you know Zane was had any chance to win, you know, the title on a, on a TV match that was just announced, yeah, you know, two hours ago. He could win the title in Saudi Arabia. He could win the title in Montreal. <laughs> we didn't consider Wilkesbury. We did not. No, but that is to say, should we? Should they have hot shot at this match for this occasion? You know, because Sami Zayn is not any other title challenger. He's somebody that you could create some really special moments with. This is the guy that a lot of people wanted to see headline WrestleMania instead of Cody Rhodes earlier this year so to you know they're telling a long-term story of like zane never having won the championship and this is still probably maybe their way of getting you know further into that story um but still like any Sami Zayn title challenge ending in a clean finish especially i feel like deserves a bigger stage to to just kind of feel special and to just get me more invested in the possibility of him even winning um so it was a great match again but i, I do question maybe just putting this one out on two hours bill 
Yeah, I think I think that's a fair comment that you know they're in a pretty like strong period right now that that you can like sometimes when when you're really doing well, you you can get away with stuff like this more, but I'll tell you if they built this up for a week, I think it would have made a lot more. So it's can't look at like MJF and Kenny Omega and look at something like this as, you know, in, in the realm of like what are the biggest TV matches you can put together. This would certainly be one of them and I think Zayn being that that figure and We'll see where this goes. Like, was this just a a one week? Like, there's no consequence of this loss. Is it not played up in in any way? We'll see. But um, yeah, you could you could certainly argue like this is one of those matches that they could have got some juice out of by uh, making it at least a week's notice before before you do it. But this was a AEW Dynamite ending to the show because it was 10:56 p.m. and the amount of stuff that they did in these four minutes. So Zayn shakes hands with Seth Rollins. They show their respect. And then as Zayn is leaving, dude, he gets run over by the judgment day. They sprinted through this man from behind. And Rollins dives to the floor to try and fight off judgment day. Jay Uso comes down to a pop, spears Balor, super kicks Priest, and then Cody's music plays and the place goes nuts as he shows up for the final two minutes of the show. Adam Pierce and the officials storm the ring and Adam Pierce, if life was an audition, this was go time for him to cut the promo of his career. It was the man's man, Sir William Pierce, as he got onto the microphone. Enough. I'm tired of the games. You four want to play games? You four want to play games? In Chicago, it's war games. And he screamed to make sure everyone in Chicago heard this announcement, even if their TV was off. And the brawl resumes. Cody gets a big dive off the top to everyone on the floor. They go down like dominoes. I thought this was a really great angle to end the show. And we mm -hmm. go off with the uh, with the men's war game match uh, set with the Judgment Day against Cody, Jay, Zayn, and Rollins. At present, a four-on-four. At present, four on four. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, I really like the idea of somehow getting Drew in, involved in this. In, I do too. In former fashion. Now, who who would be on the judgment Judgment Day side if Drew joins the baby faces? So you do have that that storyline that I can't imagine was done for no reason, where you did have the temporary like alliance with the bloodline, mm. and you could get like we know Roman is not scheduled for Survivor Series, but like they get solo on loan or something like that. Um, Will you, Nick you, Aldis agree to that? Come on, this is a help a, a raw only a, a war games here. Well, it it it's one idea of the like what you have like that you you yeah. do have like this this te this temporary alliance between Rhea and Paul Heyman that you've you went out of your way to establish that week on SmackDown. Certainly, certainly they 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 could certainly do that. Um, I I also wondered if like any SmackDown members might might be joining this. Um, namely like somebody like an LA Knight who's still I think really hot and to follow him up with like another big match, uh, like a War Games would make sense, but. You know he has no reason to want to take out the judgment day so it doesn't necessarily make sense from that perspective either um but a four on four is maybe at this point like like your most likely situation so um, Sol solo should be in a really big match at survivor series like coming off the, the cena win like he should mm -hmm. be programmed for something big on on the show yeah um so anyway i i thought the, i thought the main event was was really strong and i thought the angle was excellent at, at the end to uh to end the show so the, like a really strong third hour of the show and i also really thought the four-way uh, and ending aside four-way was a very good match and i also enjoyed the the tag match and the opener yeah i thought um this was, was like a, a good raw a really good follow-up to um crown jewel they delivered on again a pay-per-view level you know title match um the built to war games was really strong at the end as well it makes me wonder if like this was always a planned war games match or if there was at one point maybe like more of an idea of a bloodline slash judgment day type of pairing and also does smackdown have any either does smackdown have a war games match and do the women have a war games match or is it just this? I think I, I think you have to do the women's war games on, on this in some fashion. I suppose so. What story? Probably though? a SmackDown women's match. Like, um, Maria's already tied up in the match with um, Zoe. Well, clearly damage control on one side. 
and you do have okay. like four yeah. of them now, and then your your babyface contingent. That so to be, be SmackDown getting the women's match at this point. I think right? I think it would have to be. I don't think. So we're what are we thinking about Bailey, um, Dakota? Bailey, ready? Yo, um, uh, Kyrie. I guess Dakota is like a question mark. Um, what her her status is, or you or you find a a fourth uh, from some hmm. sort. Yeah, and oh, sorry on the babyface side. Can you name four? Um, <laughs> Charlotte? Title Shotsky. Right. Sh- uh, Charlotte and Shotzi are best friends now. Mm-hmm. So you've got that. Uh, it, Bianca. Yep. So there you go. Three on three. We've got a three on three. Scarlet finally comes in. Scarlet. Um, uh, Zelina. I, I don't know. Like th- th- she's not even at, at all involved in the story. It, it, somebody it requires will some out. work. It requires okay. some work. If right. Dakota's good to go, then you, then you got your four. And then yeah. you just got to put some baby faces together. And you got uh, you got a whole two episodes to get ready for uh that's it oh yeah this this pay-per-view is in less than three weeks oh wow so they've got uh let me make sure yeah dude they've oh they, they've got they've got three episodes of smackdown 10, oh huge 17, difference three weeks yeah huge world of difference but a good episode of raw overall and sets up uh two matches for war games as we or i guess three if you include the uh the ic title match if that stays together with gunther and the miz as of now right yes which i'm I'm somewhat more interested. Are you sure that'll be um pay-per-view and not just a TV match? They said it would be Survivor Series. Oh, they did. Yes. Okay. Right. And then Rhea Ripley against Zoe Stark. So those are our matches. All right. If you want to send in a super chat, you can uh hit us up for any questions you would like concerning uh the NHL, um yeah. the NFL, any movies, um okay, whatever well, you would like. And we also have forum.postwrestling.com to get to. Let's start off here with Jake from the Windy City who sends <laughs> – excuse me, everybody. I'm, I'm still coming off of a Way terrible bad this. You want me to read? Yeah, please. Jake writes, hi, fellas. So they're planning a WWE experience exhibit in Saudi. I know people have talked about WWE holding a physical Hall of Fame for years. Could this be a possibility where it can be held? Yeah, I think that's 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 been speculated upon. Like this could be where the physical Hall of Fame goes for WWE. Like they in are – Saudi Arabia. They are putting roots oh. down in like I don't think that was just a nothing comment by Vince McMahon about this being our our home. Like they are, it seems like this is as embedded as they've ever been with Saudi Arabia. And this this experience, I think it's only the entry point for for more. And the idea of bigger shows there, or like I think the sky's the limit for them. Like here is a government that is willing to spend unbelievable amounts of, of money, and they are very happy to accept are they going to make saudi arabia the the wrestling capital of the world um might be their goal might be maybe 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 tko is just gonna like uh open up shop there i mean we're not really even kidding right like we're you know they're at this point like it would make all the sense in the world for them to even open an office you know i don't know put, put a performance center down and, and and just have all of their um i don't know talents on that side of the world train there um if enough money is being spent on it, then what's stopping them? Nothing. Yeah. So uh, right. maybe maybe you will get your your physical Hall of Fame there in uh, Saudi Arabia. Okay. Let's go to the forum and uh, see what everyone has to say about tonight's edition of Raw. As I pull this up here, and first piece uh, of feedback oh. comes from Anthony in Melbourne. Slightly unrelated question, but local advertising for Elimination Chamber does not contain Roman Reigns. How much would you read into this as Roman not being on Elimination Chamber, along with the rumors of his only PLE before Mania being the Royal Rumble? Um, I wouldn't view that as like hard and fast, but if he's not on the advertising, I mean, I I think it's a reasonable assumption to make that he might not be on, on that show. Like clearly we're seeing that, you know, when he's not on a Survivor Series, like these are, you know, even a big show in Australia, it's not going to necessarily include uh, R- Roman Reigns. So um, mm-hmm. I haven't even seen like the the, the postscript for it. But if, he, if he's and, not on it, I would certainly look at that as a possibility. He's off that card. And and the chamber is not necessarily a match type that relies on Roman Reigns, right? It yeah. might not and, even have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. And I was just gonna say, I. I don't think like certainly you can look at th- there is a bit of a of a handicap when you're booking without your your main guy, but it's not like these shows are suffering without him either. Mm-hmm. And yeah, for the February show, that's always a tough show to book your your champion on. And they've got Seth Rollins now, so 
that's your big championship match to to put on and then you have two chamber matches and it's yeah i'm i'm really willing to bet that they would love to have roman reigns in us on every one of their shows um but we we don't own details of roman's negotiations and you, clearly the man is is somebody who mm, for whatever reason like has negotiated a very limited schedule listen if you can negotiate that great like we have lived in an industry where guys have had very, very minimal leverage. So when you have it, I, I applaud anyone that makes a contract to the best of their, their lifestyle. He has here, if, if he's not part of the show, then I can see a big number one contenders match in the chamber to set up Cody. But then that made me realize who do you have win the Royal rumble? And does that mean you would have them go for Seth's title instead? I mean, this is, this is the stuff you do every year. Like there's always like, your rumble winner. You have, I mean, you have two titles this year, which you did not have last year. So mm -hmm. it's a, a lot easier, I would say, to program these shows where you have two title shots. You really have four title shots up for grabs because we have the two women's titles, the two men's titles. They will have more than enough to to set things up. I feel like I would have Cody because he's already won the Rumble. Maybe like have Cody earn a shot in the chamber and then whoever is facing Rollins, you know, could be. I uh, would take your pick. Yeah, I, I was point. down to Gunther and Cody again. It's the final two. Gunther goes over. This time around. Yeah, exactly. I think that that exact, exactly is the finish. Cody's trying to, you know, earn his way back to WrestleMania, loses the Rumble, and his last chance is the Chamber. Um, all right. Let's go to Jesse Hyde, who says, do you think New Japan is bringing back the IWGP IC title? I mean, the way it's been set up, it's like the, the UK championship and not. US championship. Like, what's bigger? Then announcing the return of the Intercontinental title. But Osprey specifically said, if it's not going to be the IC title, then make a new one. Well, what so what's it? bigger than the than the continent that's not the world? Um, Atmosphere. Intergalactic championship. That's bigger than the world. You can't be that big. Well, I, I think they've kind of pigeonholed themselves. They're, they're kind of in a corner. Right. Um, uh... I'll be honest. I really don't care. I don't. I don't care what this title is. Uh, is named. Mm -hmm. Did you like the angle that they did? Loved it. It was great. Um, I mean, I I, I saw you know people maybe mm, being a little bit deflated that it's not a singles match between Osprey and Moxley. I just think maybe um politically, I I can understand why they'd want to put a new Japan you, guy. You in hit that. it on the head on Saturday. Like yeah. it's like Moxley is not your long term guy, and Osprey probably isn't either. It's mm -hmm. I mean, that's but that's the, a, that's a great match for January fourth. But what's our direction January fifth? Exactly. Those ballot shots from Finley were very effective. I haven't seen really a title that beat up like you know, um, maybe since Naito. You know, that was me. one of those mallets you get at like the fair, but like a legit one. Yeah, did some damage. Uh, also, Ocon versus Moxley was a terrific brawl. Oh, tremendous! Yeah, yeah where that crowd was so pissed about the count out, like the idea. Did this guy Dude, fly here to he do cut a his, finish? He cut his ponytail off. I wasn't expecting that mid match. Yeah, that was almost just forgotten by the end of the match. He cut the ponytail off. Yeah, like that so. that could have been a big stip match for Ocon. Yeah, yeah. The so he's more I, synonymous with. Yeah, it was really it was, it was pretty crazy. That's highly recommended from uh, Power Struggle. Let's go to Manny from Pacoima who says, "Who had Miz delivers a tilt a world DDT on their bingo card." Really enjoyable edition of Raw. Looking forward to seeing Rhea versus Zoe in a few weeks. DIY versus the Creeds was good for the time, amount of time it was given. Uh, there definitely was a bit of a feeling up process, and the match felt a bit short, in my opinion. Sammy versus Rollins was fantastic, and that ending segment to set up War Games was done very well. I got my ticket for the Revolver debut in LA. I'm looking forward to Mascara Dorado's New Japan debut. And wow, that tribal council from last week's Survivor episode. I'm not Batman, I'm the Canadian. Caleb explain this was the okay. shot in the dark the six the six to one odds and he uh he came out the other end saved himself he was he he plays the shot in the dark so no votes against him would count and you only play this if you're paranoid that you're going to be the guy voted out so they read every single person voted for him and he had Ooh. saved himself and this was a one in six chance he had that this would work and it worked for him that the votes right. did not count and uh Jay was eliminated. What's I'm not Batman. I'm the Canadian. What's that line? Because he's this is the guy that he is working everybody, and he's it, it was it was just a line that he used, and it was the name of the the episode was 
um, okay. people thinking he's conniving. He's like, I'm not Batman. I'm a Canadian. You can't think I'm a, uh, I don't know. Didn't quite get the analogy with a, with Batman, but anyway. All right. Yeah, All right. There. Okay. Great season. Okay. Last one here is from Muggin, a strong raw that flew by the whole show, except one match had no nonsense finishes. I hope that continues. Rollins and Zane was match of the night and the four way a distant second. Miz was motivated. And I, and I'm a little more interested in him versus Gunther than I was a week ago. The battle Royal did the job pushing newer feuds and it protected Becky from losing unnecessarily. The episode ended hot with the war games match. I've expected it would be. I hope it stays four on four. That is what we have as of now. We will see if any changes are made to, uh, war games but it's going to wrap up the show thank you to everybody for uh stopping by and uh one one more time for the charitybuzz.com slash mmm2 you can go and bid on multiple items including your very own rewind away which we'll be releasing for all cafe members but you will get to choose the event and if you so choose you can come on for a segment as well and it comes with a great uh, merchandise bundle from post wrestling two exclusive designs that uh, no one else has had yet so your chance to uh to land these shirts and a poster of the event that you choose designed hand drawn by robert pearson himself beautiful work as always uh from robert pearson so again the deadline is tuesday night 7 p.m eastern time to place your bids again charitybuzz.com slash mmm2 all right thank you robert for joining us all of you for listening we are back on wednesday night with rewind to dynamite talk will be dropping on thursday and then we've got rewind to smackdown on friday coverage this weekend of ufc 295 the Lone Star Shootout from New Japan Strong. Another weekend, another slew of events coming your way. So that is it for us. Good night. Goodbye. We'll speak with you on Wednesday.